Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study, our special study in the life of David from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 19. Now, before we begin, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins at the same time we're allowing His Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for providing all that we need to study your word today. We ask that our hearts and our minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. In the last lesson, we looked at three different historical events in the life of David. We saw him building up the palace and the fortress of the city of David with the help of King Hiram of Tyre. And we learned that this came after he had these battles with the Philistines. We learned about David's extended family with his wives and concubines and many sons. So the last time we were together, we studied the battles of these Philistines against David. Let's look at those verses again, and then we will continue from there. Begins in verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to search for David. When David heard of it, he went down to the stronghold. The Philistines also had come and spread themselves in the valley of Raphaim. Now remember, that means the valley of the giants. That's near <clears throat> Jerusalem few miles out here. See it here on the bottom left of our map. Just southwest of Jerusalem. Well, when these type of things happen in David's life, he goes to the Lord, just like we should do when we get in a situation where we wonder what we're supposed to do. We go to the Lord, put it in prayer. And in those days, he'd go to the priest. They would check with the uh, sacred Urim and Thummim, which would give them answers from the Lord. Verse 19, And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand, which is a way of saying they'll have victory over the Philistines. Now, as I said, he'd go to the priest, remember Beathar? He'd pull out the Urim and Thummim, to determine the Lord's will. And he got the word to go ahead and go out and fight them. David obeyed as he should. Verse 20. And David came to Baal Parazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like breaking floodwaters. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Parazim, Lord of Breaking Through. Well, this would be right near that valley somewhere where David led his armies. Now, the description of the Lord being involved here is interesting. He broke through like breaking floodwaters. Have you ever seen a dam break or, you know, something on television where you see water suddenly rush in? Sometimes it's in the desert and like a one of the ditches or something. You want to be sure to be out of there if, a, if water uh, starts coming. So it's a very dangerous and quick situation. So it's described here as the Lord going ahead of David, breaking through. Now, sometimes in the battles we see Israel with the Philistines or somebody else, we see the Lord involved, and he can do several things. He can, uh, well, in, in, in Scripture, if you go into also the, the future period, during the time of the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, he can confuse the armies, they can turn on each other, it can get real dark all of a sudden. Uh, the people go into panic. Uh, there's all types of ways the Lord can do this. But basically, he leads the way and prepares the battlefield for David to enter and have a victory. Now, this word breaking through, sometimes used even for Israel. Sometimes the Lord broke out on Israel in some sort of discipline or punishment sometimes. But we also see it as we do here with the enemies. So the Lord clears the way for David, 
and the place is actually called Baal Perazim, meaning the Lord breaking through. Well, the victory was so quick, verse 21, and the Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. Now, these idols would be like little statues that they thought looked like their gods or represented their gods. Now, these gods are not real, of course. Sometimes they're actually demons. They're demonic. They're fallen angels. Well, anyway, the Philistines got out of there real quick, and they just dropped their idols and left. Now, why would they have their idols? Well, these idols, you could carry them, well, we'd say in our backpacks today. They weren't too big, maybe 10 inches or so. It was basically kind of their good luck charm. And they figured if they had one of these little idols of their god that they would have a better chance at victory. Well, this didn't work. So what happened is after David's men attacked, they grabbed these idols and the normal procedure, according to the law, was to burn them. We read that in, we read that in Deuteronomy 7, 5 and 7, 25. Well, what happens is the Philistines scattered, went down, and probably joined up with the larger force. So this makes me think that in this first battle, it was just a bunch of raiding bands that were grouped in one area. So you may have had, you know, several hundred men there. And there, remember, they were raiding the area. They would cover the area. They'd go to cities, take their food. Then they'd come back to their camp. Well, there's probably not that many people there. And so David won this battle with the Lord's help, of course. But then they would go gather with the larger group. This is the way I'm, I'm understanding it. So there's going to be another battle with the Philistines in the same place. Okay? So verse 22 almost sounds like a repeat. And the Philistines came up again, came up yet again, and spread out in the valley of Raphaim. Now, the first time David attacked him, it appears he went straight at him. You know, what they call a frontal attack. Our front lines will attack straight into yours. This is going to be different. The Lord directs him to do a different thing. Verse 23. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go up, that means go right up at him, frontally. You won't attack their front. Go around to the rear, their rear, and come up against them opposite the balsam trees. So let's talk about this attack. So the first time David would just lead his men, let's get the pencil up here, straight in to their front, okay? So here they are facing each other. This time, and I understand this is probably being a much larger force instead of a frontal attack. Let's get the enemy down here. I'm just going to use arrows, represent the enemy. And I'm going to put back here some trees. Okay, this is just a forest, okay? This time, David is told, instead of going forward, they're going to go around them and come up behind. Now, how far they had to go out and come in? We don't know, but they'd come out behind these balsam trees. So David would have his men down here ready to attack. Now what about these balsam trees? Well, in the United States and in some other countries, a balsam tree is sometimes a Christmas tree. You know what a Christmas tree looks like, right? It's kind of cone-shaped, uh, cone like an arrowhead, points towards the sky. Well, in Israel, from what I've seen, they're big and bushy. In fact, they're more like, let's see if I can get a little, let's just get a trunk here. They have their trunks, but they're kind of like this. They're just big and bushy, okay? So we have a string of these trees all across here. David's men are behind. Now, they can't be seen. Now, the hard thing about getting behind somebody is, first of all, it could be a long ways because you don't want them to see you <clears throat> or you don't want them to hear you. It could also take a lot of extra time, and you didn't want them, uh, somewhat, some of their men out here maybe on sort of outpost, seeing you or hearing you. So David had to be real careful and get his whole army around here undetected. Now, so they go behind, and they come up opposite the balsam trees on this other side. Now, 
Let's go to verse 24. So they're back there behind those trees with the enemy out in front of them. The Lord continues with his instructions. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, act decisively, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. So they're to wait back there until they hear the sound of the army over the trees. Now, it wouldn't go through the trees very well, right? So the sound would come over. And their orders are, when you hear those, uh, with the sound of marching, you attack. Act decisively, it says. And then explains, for, or we could say because, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. So that means the Lord himself has went out and prepared uh, for victory for the army of Israel. So the Lord leads the attack again, just like we saw a while ago, when he broke out like flooding waters. And it says he goes in and strikes down the army of the Philistines. Verse 25 tells us what happened after that in the pursuit of battle. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba till you go to Gezer. Now, we need to look at a map. And you know I have bunches of those. So here we go. So they fought right down in here where you see the flash. I've tried to find better ways to do this, but I just haven't been able to. They chased them up to Gibeon all the way out to Gezer. Now they're getting close to the Philistine territory over here to Gezer. And that's a good thing. We want them over there. Now, Gibeon's about six miles from Jerusalem between here and up here. And this is another uh, 15 miles out to Gezer. Gezer's one of the most important, important archaeological sites in the entire area. Uh, where they do their digs and they find things. You've seen movies like that in Indiana Jones, and those type of movies. They have archaeological sites and they'll dig and they'll have hire people locally. And Anyway, today they have found both Philistine and Israelite remains in that area. So what David does, he pushes the Philistines clear over to Gezer. Now remember, David's got his army organized now. He's recently become king. Um... Um, and the Philistines' uh, army is run out. So David's got his army organized. He's getting his new kingship kingdom in shape for the future. David knew how far he needed to go to get them out of the area, and he wanted control of that area. He's going to want out. He's going to want them out of here, so he can even be down here. Uh, safe if you want to go to Kiriath Jerim. So the Philistines are out of the area. They've all gone over back to their own land, or at least <clears throat> out of range of David's army. Now, in chapter 6, we come back to the point after the two battles of the Philistines. Remember, we saw the correct order in this. Uh, we have the battles of the Philistines. Let's just write that up there. We have the battle. I should say battles, these two battles. Then David's going to go in to the fortress of the Jebusites, and he's going to conquer it. So he conquers Jebus, right? Remember that? Renames it the city of David. So he gets into the city, he builds up the city, we studied about that, he expanded it, he built a palace, that's where he came into contact with King Hiram of Tyre. So he has a secure place now, and he wants the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant, sometimes called the Ark of God, the Ark of the Lord, even the Ark of the Testimony. We're familiar with it, usually as the Ark of the Covenant. 
So, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, for that, we're going to do a flashback. Now, that's a big flashback, okay? Let's go forward. Okay, we're going to do a big flashback. We're going to go back and look at the subject of, I'm just going to call it, the Ark of the Covenant. The faster I write, the sloppier it gets. But anyway, you can read that, I think. Now, let's talk about it. The Ark of the Lord, Ark of God, or the Ark of the Covenant, goes back to the time of Moses, who was instructed to build it in Exodus 25.10. Now, I don't know if I should even try to draw it. I don't think I will. But basically, it's a big box, okay? We call it a chest. It was made of a certain type of wood, acacia wood. And it had a lid on it. And you could open it up, and inside was the Ten Commandments, the two tablets that Moses had. There's Aaron's budding rod. There's a story behind that. There's a golden urn filled with manna. Of course, that points back to being in the wilderness. And you can see the list of things in it in Exodus 16, 33 through 34. There's one in the New Testament in Hebrews 9, 4. Well... The shape of the ark was rectangular. Basically, it's a rectangular box. It measures, I'm going to give you cubits and then centimeters and then inches, okay? It's two and a half cubits by one and a half by one and a half cubits. By centimeters, it's 114 by 69 by 69 centimeters. In inches, it's 45 inches. You know how I picture that? A yardstick plus about, uh, what's that, nine, uh, nine inches? A yardstick plus nine inches, a little under four feet. 27 inches by 27. So it was uh, 27 high and 27 wide, 45 long. It had rings on each corner on the top. And they would pass through these rings poles. So that basically, I think I can draw this part. We're just going to keep it small. So you had this chest. You had the rings. Okay. And through these rings were poles. Okay. And it would hang down. And the Levites, each man would get... In a corner, there were a pole on each side, so you had four, you had two poles, and you had four men carrying this thing. Okay, and they were carrying it. On top of it was some figures of angels. We'll talk about them. I shouldn't try to draw them too much, but they had their wings. Okay. That's a little bit of it. You've probably seen pictures of this. You've seen uh, Indiana Jones, probably. Well, it's something like that. But there are some problems with that, as I'll explain. So, on top of this, uh, top of it, was what they call the mercy seat. And it was all gold, except for about an inch or so on each end. 45 inches or so of golden mercy seat. Now, what's that mean? It's a big piece of gold sitting on top it could this is the lid okay mercy seat was where god looked down upon it and looked for the blood during the sacrifices but let me just get through the description so you have these two cherubim sitting on the ends with their wings outstretched they're facing inward so they're looking towards it portraying perhaps angels right there with the lord now, here's what we're supposed to imagine. We're supposed to imagine this being the throne of God. And he's sitting there, and he has his feet right here on the mercy seat called a footstool. Listen to 1 Chronicles 28, 2. 1 Chronicles 28, 2. King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my brothers and my people. I wanted to build a temple where the Ark of the Lord's Covenant could be placed as a footstool for our God. I have made the preparations 
for building it. I want you to notice the footstool for our God. Now, you know the story, if you do, that David was not allowed to build the temple. His son Solomon would do that. But David was given this great covenant. Now, when this thing was first made, it was supposed to be a place for Moses to meet with the Lord. Listen to Exodus 25, 22. Now, we're going way back now. The Lord is speaking, There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, cause it the testimony there, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Now, this is the most important piece of furniture that was given to Israel to make that would be put in the tabernacle, which is the tent, and then later they put it in the temple when, once they built the temple. And what is stunning is that this Ark of the Covenant has basically been out of the history of Israel for over 50 years. Now, I'll explain that a little bit later. In other words, they haven't been using it. They haven't gotten the right place. So the question is, where is the ark? We haven't heard about it for a long time. We heard it back during the time of the introduction, if you remember. Uh, but uh, I should say the first lesson. But let's go back and study the story of the ark. So I'm just going to let you listen. All right. It goes back to Eli. Eli was one of the last judges in the history of Israel. After him would be Samuel. Eli had been a high priest and judge over Israel many years, but now he is very old. He had two sons, Phinehas and Hophni. But they were not very good men. They got into all kinds of trouble into sexual immorality. They kept violating the rules and how to be priest. And they were not allowed to be promoted up and remain in the position of a judge or high priest. But at the same time, under Eli was a little boy. His name was Samuel. So Eli trained Samuel. And when Samuel was ready, he became the next judge. Now Samuel is an established prophet. That is, he grew up, and one of the first things in life, his life, came the fact that he could uh, prophesy for the Lord. He'd tell the future, the same time he had proclaimed the Lord's will to the people. Now, let's get a map up. Let me show you some things. Now, remember, we're going back in time. This is long before David. The ark is kept in a town called Shiloh. This is where Samuel is. This is where Eli is and his sons Phinehas and Hophni. Samuel was a prophet. He's in his early 20s, about 25 or so. He gets a word from the Lord that the Israelites need to go to war with the Philistines. The story continues in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 1. Now it appears that the sons of Eli are involved in this battle. They went to battle with the Philistines. They put their camp at Ebenezer. This is where they're going to basically fight the Philistines in this area. The first battle... The Israelites are defeated, and they don't know why. Well, the elders who were there leading decided they need the ark. So they sent over and got the ark, which was in Shiloh, and brought it over to Ebenezer. Now, Samuel's not with them, and neither is Eli. Remember, Eli's an old man. They thought if they had the ark, well, then maybe it would be a good luck charm. Now they're thinking like Philistines. Well, they still lost the battle. And not only that, but they lost the ark. And the sons of Eli were killed. Big loss. The ark was captured. Hophni and Phinehas were killed. When Eli got word 
that the ark had been captured and his sons killed. Now he's an old he's an old fat man. He's ninety eight years old, and he's blind by the way. When he heard of that bad news, he fell over backwards in his chair. He probably tried to stand up and tripped and fell backwards, something like that. He broke his neck and died. Now, a short side story. He had a daughter-in-law who was married to Phinehas. All right, his son was Phinehas. Her wife, his wife rather, was about to have a baby. About that time, she had the baby. Let's read about that. Okay, I'm going to keep my picture up there for a moment because that's still our topic. So about that time, she had a baby. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from the Lord, from Israel, excuse me, from, the, from Israel, because the ark of God has been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. So she felt that the glory of the Lord had departed from Israel. Now, usually when the glory is with Israel, they win their battles. I think it became obvious. She named her son. It would be a reminder that the Lord was not with them. Now they've lost the ark to the Philistines. Well, the Philistines are going to have a problem with this ark. This gets interesting. The Philistines try to find a place to keep the ark. Let's get our map back up. All right, so they're at Ebenezer. And they're going to move it. They moved it to Ashdod. Notice where Ashdod is? Way down here. See it? Well within Philistine territory, away from the Israelites. Um, they put it in the temple. The temple of Dagon. D-A-G-O-N. So it's sitting in there and they have the, you know, the little, the, well this is probably bigger since the temple. They had a temp, they'd have a statue of Dagon. And they had the ark in there. Well, the next morning, they found Dagon had been tumped over. He had fallen on his face. You know, you say, what in the world happened? Well, they set it back up, and the next day, they went back in there and fell on his face again. But this time, its hands had broken off. Not only that, the people of Ashdod were, getting to, were starting to get tumors, some sort of growth, all right, skin growth. And they decided they want the ark out of the city because they were blaming their bad luck, so to speak, on this ark. The city leader, leaders sent it over to Gath. All right, here's Ashdod, here's Gath. Now, we know Gath from the home, being the hometown of uh, Goliath, right? So they kept it there. The people of Gath went into panic when an outbreak of tumors started showing up on their people. So they send it up to Ekron. Now it's in Ekron. Well, they thought, why would they do that? Are they trying to kill us? And death filled the city along with panic. And they believe now that God was severely punishing them for having this ark among the people. And those who didn't die got tumors. And they cried out to heaven. They were miserable. They called on their own priest and their diviners, the ones that try to sort out what their gods want, what they should do. Well, just common sense would say, send that gift back. And that's what they did. They decided, we're going to send the gift back. They compared it to, uh, if you remember, the plagues on Egyptians. When they sent Israel away, the plagues went away. So that's what they were thinking of. All total, the Philistines had the ark for about seven months before they decided to send it to Israel. Now, listen to the story of how they send it over to Israel. They get a brand new cart, and they're going to put milk cows on it. That means new mama cows. They just had calves. Well, you know that a calf wants its mama, and a mama wants its calf, just like any animal when there's a baby. Well, what they did, they took the calves and pinned them up somewhere. They have these two milk cows now going to pull this new cart with the ark sitting on it. And their way of doing this is saying, we're just going to let it go. If it goes over the Israelites, that shows us that 
this is where our suffering is coming from, from their God. If it comes back to us, that's not what's going on. Well, they decide to let it go, and it goes over to Beth Shemesh. Well, this is in Israel. This is in Judah, the tribe of Judah area. Beth Shemesh. Now, this was a Levite city. If you remember Levite cities, they had priests in certain cities around all Israel. So they'd have Levites there. And they took the ark. The Philistines watched the uh, cart for some time before they just went back home and they reported what happened. So now the ark is in the possession of the Israelites in the tribe of Judah, particularly with these Levites. So they take the ark. But then what happened is people went up to the ark and started looking inside of it. Well, that was forbidden. They weren't even supposed to touch it. That's, how they, that's why they had it on poles in the first place. It wasn't supposed to be touched. It was too sacred. And the people were dying because they touched the ark. So they wanted it out of there too. Now they can't even keep it in a, an Israelite city, see? So what they do, they send messengers up to this place called Kiriath-Jarim. See it up here? Deeper into the land of Israel in the particularly the tribal area of Judah. They send messengers up there for them to come and get it and take it to their home. Now let's go back to our passage, uh, actually in the Old Testament still. It's picking up the story. This is still part of our flashback. They're getting rid of the ark, even in the town of um. Beth Shemesh. And the men of Kiriath Jerem came and took up the ark and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eliezer to have charge of the ark of the Lord. So he'd take care of it. The son of Abinadab. He's going to take care of the ark. We're just going to let there and let it rot. They're going to dust it and they're going to keep it clean. Well, they probably can't dust it. I take that back because they couldn't touch it. But they were just going to guard it, basically, is what this means. And it happened that from that day, the ark stayed at Kiriath Jerim a long time past, some 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Now, this says a couple of important things. First of all, this is where they kept it for a long time. It's actually a lot longer than 20 years. We'll see why. But it was there for some time, and the people of Israel began to realize they're not right with the Lord. And they start lamenting. They start crying out for the Lord. That's what this means. In other words, they're turning back to the Lord. Now, it's been a long, dry period. Uh, the people of Israel were probably more than anything, more disobedient over their history than anything. They're noted for that because they're always getting punished, always losing battles. They go up and down, but mostly they're down. Some did better than others. Um, there's a lot more history behind this. But what happens is Samuel, the prophet, he challenges the people to all turn back to the Lord, which they did for a time. Then they started winning battles against the Philistines. Now, remember, we're still talking about the ark. Till the end of Samuel's rule as a judge, all through Saul's kingship, 40 years, up to the point of David ready to move it in to Jerusalem, it's been in Kiriath Jerim. Now, there is a story, and we studied this briefly in one of our first lessons. In 1 Samuel 14, 18 through 19, where Saul had the ark brought up to a battle scene, and he was going to have the priest there give a pre battle uh, ritual, basically to bless his soldiers in the battle. But he Saul was hearing the noise of the Philistines, he got nervous and he cut it short. And he was penalized for that. That was something he shouldn't have done. That's another reason he was um, told he could not continue as a blessed king in Israel. Uh, he lost the Spirit's power, if you know and remember the story. We've already studied that. So anyway, 
This brings us to David with his plans to go over and bring it back from Kirath Jarim. Let me show you the map again. Over to Jerusalem, right over here. All right, to the right. There it is, right there. Okay. So, let's go to 2 Samuel, back to 2 Samuel chapter 6, where we'll continue our story. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. Now, this is a select group of men, probably his best fighters. He gets them together, some 30,000 troops. That's a lot of people. That's bigger than a lot of cities. And he's going to take them over there, a special mission. He's going to get the ark and bring it back to Jerusalem. That's his plan anyway. And he's closer to the Philistine territory. And if they hear about him coming to get the ark, they might attack. So he's going to be safe. He's got plenty of men to go get it and bring it back. Verse 2. Now this is kind of a involved verse, so we're going to spend a little time on it. It'll be our last verse. And David and all the men who were with him arose and went to and back from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of armies, who sits enthroned between the cherubim that are on it. There's three or four things we want to look at here. It's awkward, first of all, the way it's said at the first. Because if I was to leave out the bracket words, David and all his men who were with him arose and went from Baale, Judah. Sounds like they left from there. But no, they went there. They're on their way back. Okay, that's the point of the story. They're on their way back to bring up from there the ark of God. You always go up to Jerusalem. So they're going to take it back up to Jerusalem. And it's called the... Uh, the Ark of the Lord. So that's what it means when it says, which is called the name of the Lord of armies. And then it describes who sets enthroned between the cherubim there on it. Now, we already learned about the Ark. We learned about the cherubim. We learned about the mercy seat, that lid that lifted up, but it was also represented the Lord's footstool. So that was where the Lord sat unseen in the presence of his people. So, remember earlier, David had chased the Philistines all the way to Gezer. This area was safe to go get the ark, and this is what they did. It was under David's control now. This is another reason he could go get it. Jerusalem is ready for it, and the area is under control. He takes a special group of men and goes over and gets it. Now, you might wonder, why didn't Saul ever do something like that? Because Saul didn't care a whole lot about it. It wasn't that important with Saul. And we've talked about Saul. He wasn't a very good king. In fact, he was terrible many times. We also have a scripture that tells us about Saul's attitude. 1 Chronicles 13.3 Then let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. So this tells us the attitude during the days of Saul. That's why I want to put out this verse. So it's been neglected and not used or utilized, I should say, for more than 50 years. Remember Saul reigned 40 years? You had part of David, you had part of Samuel being a judge, and it's been sitting over there in that town for over 50 years. Now, it may be hard to understand. Why would they do that? Something I've talked about many times. Do you know what it is? The people's attitude, the king's attitude, has to do with, what am I going to write? Obedience. What I call the obedience factor. If they're not obedient, they don't care about the things of God. They don't care about his blessing. And this has been the way the hearts have been for many years with Israel. It's going to change with David. They had some good times back in the days of Samuel, some. 
And now we have this long stretch in between. In the meantime, the ark is in this town we've been talking about. Keroth Jarim. At this point in the narrative, it becomes the point of interest. It's about the ark. That's why I want to give you all that background to tell you about it, what it does, what its function is. Uh, it's also the place they place the blood on top of the mercy seat during the Day of Atonement for the forgiveness of the people. It's a very important piece of furniture. Now, it's called the Ark of God. In this chapter alone, just in this chapter, it's called the Ark of God in, in verses 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, and 12. It's called the Ark of the Lord in verses 9, 10, 11, 13, 15, 16, 17, almost every verse. Seven times each name. Same God, his possession. Call him the Lord God. Call him God or Lord. It's his Ark. Just a reminder, the name God is basically the same name that everyone had for God. All right, it could be God's or capitalized God's, as I have it over here. However, Lord is the personal name for God, Yahweh. Up here, it's Elohim. All right, so this is God's ark. He owns it. It's his property. And then we look at this last phrase in our verse. One we should understand now. Who sets in throne between the cherubim that are on it. So that tells where the Lord who owns it sits. This is a way of saying this is where he rules from. This is his place of authority. This is well known uh, throughout the history of Israel. Let me give you some verses. Let's go to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Listen to this one. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Let's do another one. Psalm 81. Psalm 81. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. So it was accepted fact that this was the place of God's presence. Now, you've probably seen the Indiana Jones movie and you saw the ark there. Well, they emphasized there what was inside the ark, what was, what was the power inside the ark. But that was not true. It was the presence of the Lord using it for a seat. That was where the power was. And when the Lord left Israel, he left that seat. That's the glory departing, you see. Well, David's idea of bringing up the ark was a good thing. But it was supposed to have been brought up by Levites and using those poles. What did the Philistines do? They put her on a cart. That was wrong. Of course, you wouldn't expect them to do it right, but you would expect David to do it right, but he also put her on a cart. But there were problems. Where were the poles? Where are the Levites assigned to bring it over? David didn't do either one of those, and that's going to lead to some disaster. And that's where we'll continue next time. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we again thank you for this uh, time we've had in your word. We ask that we'll be challenged with what we heard and getting to know David and your plan for his life and what you can do in ours. Make the proper application. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.